Breaking news, the Canon R1 has leaked and it is amazing. Maybe it's even unbelievable, but I believe it and I'm gonna break it down for you and tell you how everything actually works and what it looks like. But first a word from our sponsor, Squarespace. Nowadays, your online interactions are more important than ever. People are sick of looking at social media cluttered with ads. Nowadays, you need your own website that reflects your own style, shows your best pictures or the work that your business is doing. Squarespace lets you set all this up, take appointments online, set up an entire online store. It's what we use for our own stuff. And if you're setting up any kind of website, go to squarespace.com slash Tony, try it out. And if you love it, coupon code Tony gets you 10% off. Thank you, Squarespace. First of all, what will the R1 look like? I think my guess is going to look exactly like a 1DX Mark III with a few refinements. Here's the thing, Canon has been the number one camera manufacturer for decades. While Nikon is chasing Canon and Sony is chasing Canon, Canon is also mainly competing against Canon. They want to move their existing 1DX shooters from the DSLR world over to the mirrorless world, but these are old pros who use these things. They've been using something that looks exactly like this 1DX for a decade or more themselves, and they don't like change. So I think Canon's gonna give them exactly what they want, which is exactly the same thing, but with the latest tech. I think all the buttons are gonna fall in the exact same place. I think it'll feel so familiar while being newer. I think they'll refresh a few things. I hope they get rid of the Casio LCD display from the 70s here on the back and the side. But overall, I think physically it's gonna be exactly the same form factor with CF Express type B cards. Now let's talk about the rumored specs from our friends over at Canon Rumors who gave this a CR0. That means he thinks it's not credible but I disagree with them here. I actually think these are some credible specs. The rumored specs are 85 megapixels at 20 frames per second. But wait, we're gonna make some sense of this. 21 megapixels at 40 frames per second and a global shutter. Okay, whoa. First of all, I gave you two different megapixel numbers and two different frame rates. We're gonna talk about exactly what that is, but first let's talk about the global shutter. A global shutter captures all of the information from the sensor instantly. That is not what normally happens. With most still camera sensors, it reads from, well, basically the top of the image down to the bottom of the image, kind of line by line. And if something is moving in the frame while it's reading, then what's happening at the bottom of the frame could be slightly later than what's happening at the top of the frame, and you will notice it. Here's an example. If you're looking at artificially flickering lights, like LED lights, pretty much any LED light, it might pulse at say 60 or 120 frames per second. If you have a global shutter, it will look totally natural. I took these pictures of my light bulb just last week. If you have a standard slow readout sensor, then you're gonna see lots of lines in it. And it's not just when you're taking light bulb photos, which most of you aren't doing, it's when you're shooting indoor sports with a high shutter speed, for example. It's also really unpredictable because you never know the arena that you're going to go in. And sometimes there'll be no banding in your photos when the player is a little bit out in the middle of the field, but they get near the edges of the field where the advertising banners are lit up with a different type of light and suddenly you'll get weird picture ruining banding. That's not something that really happens with the DSLR sports cameras but it would happen with mirrorless cameras like the Canon R5. And Canon isn't gonna tell their sports shooters to give up their 1DX and go to a camera that's going to exhibit this type of banding when shooting nighttime sports. Even if it's only 5% of the time and 5% of the fields, because those shooters require the cameras to be 100% reliable. Canon wouldn't settle for anything less. And that's why I think Canon actually would make a global shutter for this camera. Another problem is rolling shutter because the top of the image is being read before the bottom of the image. If you're panning to the left, as I was for this shot, for example, chasing a player running across the field, you'll see everything ends up kind of diagonal looking. You'll see this a lot in movies, video, when there's a whip pan, you know, the camera goes shoo, and if you were to pause it, you would see everything slanted to the side. There are a few video cameras, like the RED uh, Komodo 6K camera. 6K is the resolution, 6K is also the price, so it's nice and expensive. People love it for those kind of action scenes. They never have to worry about rolling shutter. You, Canon themselves have made 
a global shutter camera, the C700. So they have some experience here because they also make cinema cameras. What about a high megapixel global shutter camera? Is that possible? There is the Falcon 4, an 86 megapixel global shutter camera, which, well, it's mono in this configuration, though you could slap a bare filter on there and make it color, but it also costs 50K. It does establish that it's possible. Now, this is for like aerial imaging and security and robotics and stuff. It's not for sports photography, but you can see Canon can do it. And especially if they're manufacturing it at scale, they might be able to make it for a price that professional shooters would consider. Is this actually going to be in there? I feel like it's probable, though I don't know. I will say within the industry, we hear people using the term global shutter to just mean a very fast shutter, which would maybe only display three or four bands instead of like the 50 that you saw in that sample picture. And rolling shutter wouldn't be eliminated, but it would just be a little bit. And for still photos, a very fast shutter can be good enough. Some of the other Canon rumor specs, they're saying it's going to have 15 and a half stops of dynamic range, which is totally reasonable. And it's going to have an ISO range of 160 to 1.6 million. Also totally possible. The upper ISO limit is totally not limited by anything except your imagination. It is just a digital multiplication of the data that comes in. So they could make it go to 10 billion if they wanted to. So the fact that they made it go to 1.6 million doesn't reflect on the actual images that you would get just that they decided to alter the software a little bit. The lower bound of 160 could mean that um, it's, it's not able to shoot at lower ISOs. Perhaps the actual design of the sensor means like the individual wells of the pixels can't handle it. And if it is 86 megapixels, that's a distinct possibility. Um, it's also, if somebody were making this up, I think it would be really weird for them to make up a base ISO of ISO 160. So this actually, for me, it actually adds a little bit of credibility to it. It's offering five axis IBIS with at nine stops of stabilization. I think the R5 does eight stops of stabilization. So this is slightly incrementally better. It's probably a bigger body that can move the sensor a little bit further around in a circle. Totally believable. The rear screen is supposed to be three, three and a half inches diagonally but super high resolution at 1280 nits, which means you should be able to see it in bright light much better and an OLED screen. Now, these are better specs than any rear screen has on any camera today, but these are totally reasonable specs for things like field monitors and smartphones. So this is completely attainable. If you look at the resolution, that would mean the pixels would be about 2000 by 1550, roughly. Um, and that would put you at about 750 pixels per inch of density. Now they say the metric they always use is human eyes can see at their minimum focusing distance about 300 pixels per inch and anything above that is wasted. So why would they put in unnecessary pixels? I don't know, but smartphone companies do this all the time. Like there are smartphones with proper 4K displays that put it at about over 800 pixels per inch. The electronic views finder is also supposed to be amazing. The rumors are that it's going to have 9.44 million dots at 120 hertz, 120 like refreshes per second, which is about what the human eye could possibly at the upper end perceive. And that's totally reasonable because that's what the A7S III and Alpha One have from Sony. So I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't do anything less. And Canon Rumors is saying that the rumor is saying it's going to be $8,500. And everybody was like, no way. Nobody's going to buy an $8,500 camera in 2021. Don't they know what's going on? Well, it, it's true. There's probably not going to be a lot of consumers buying it. But the key market for this is going to be like ESPN, who will just buy, you know, 200 of these and distribute them to their shooters who are going to be on the sidelines or the Associated Press who's now shooting Sony or dentists, you know, like there are a million dentists out there who have $180,000 Porsche 911 sitting in their driveway just for fun. The ones that they don't even drive, they just think it's cool to show it to their friends and stuff like, believe it or not, people have disposable income and that makes up a significant portion of the people who do buy these expensive cameras. They just like 
expensive toys, even if they're not using them for professional purposes. Let's go back and talk about the resolution. How is it that it was 86 megapixels at 20 frames per second or 21 megapixels at 40 frames per second? There is an emerging technology used by many new smartphones now that provides this sort of hybrid between fast readout and high resolution, allowing the camera to pick between one of those two options called Quad Bear. Let's talk about what that is. On the right here, we see a standard bear filter. I have a video all about this if you're not familiar with this, but it's the red, green, blue filter that's on top of your sensor. Each pixel only gets red, green, or blue, but then in post, kind of inside the camera, the demosaicing algorithm figures out what the colors in your picture should be. Quad bear looks different than that. It groups together four red, four green, four blue. And when you're doing a fast readout, a fast low resolution readout, it does pixel binning. It reads each group of four pixels as one big pixel. And thus, it's actually reducing the resolution of the sensor fourfold, making it much, much faster. And what Quad Bear does is, technically you can put the camera in a separate mode will it, where it will read each individual pixel, but it takes longer. It generates more data, it generates more heat when you're processing it and such. So you can't necessarily use it for video, but it does give you the ability to produce high megapixel images at will without sacrificing the ability to do fast readout for things like video or 40 frames per second stills, for example. So it gives you the awesome specs. You can brag about high, having a high megapixel camera. That's what the smartphones do, even though most of the time they don't actually use the high resolution version. It doesn't cost a whole lot more to create one of these quad bear sensors. There's not really a sacrifice in image quality and you get the option to bump it up when you want to and you can brag about the higher spec. But if we were to compare an 86 megapixel quad bear sensor versus an 86 megapixel standard bear sensor, there would be some disadvantages in image quality. Here is an example of the quad bear sensor. Notice that each four pixels are bundled together. Let's say we have a small blue object that appears in the frame, and it just so happens to land on one of the groups of red pixels. This blue object would essentially be invisible because the sensor can only see it if it overlaps one or more of the blue photo sites here. So that would be lost. That's an example of how a quad bear filter could completely lose color without being able to see it like it's colorblind. Here's another example. If there was a blue object that happened to land on one of these groups of four blue photosites, the sensor wouldn't necessarily be able to distinguish a small blue object from a big blue object because there's just not as much color resolution in this particular layout. Like honestly, these two could look pretty much indistinguishable to the sensor. So the sensor is always having to make these big guesses about color in the demosaicing algorithm. Another thing that can happen, especially with clothing and fabrics, is you get these like fine patterns and textures that repeat. And if these happen to line up with the pixels, you can get some really strange artifacts. Like imagine we have some blue polka dots that happen to light up all of these groups of four blue photo sites. Well now, to the sensor, it looks like it could be a big blue or maybe a violet object that is just covering the entire span of the sensor. Run this same scenario on a standard bear filter and let's drop that blue on there. Here you can see where it happened to land, same size, same photo site size. It happened to land on two blue photo sites. Move it a little bit here, it's completely covering one blue photo site, but the sensor still knows it's blue. Here it's landing on four but the sensor can still tell. The sensor has more color resolution. Quad Bear gives you more resolution. It gives you better specs, but it doesn't give you the full image quality that you would expect at that high resolution. Still, in our testing, the Quad Bear does give you significantly more detail than you get out of the binned image. In other words, the 86 megapixel image quality would be better than the 21 megapixel image quality and it would have a lot of detail in it, but it wouldn't match that of another 86 megapixel camera if it had a standard bear filter on it. If these specs are true, then this camera probably will not have full width 8K because that would require a lot of crunching. It probably will have full width 4K and it might offer 
8K at a significant crop, like a 1.8 times crop. Let's compare the rumored R1 against the very real Sony Alpha One. The rumored R1 is $8,500, while the Alpha One from Sony is $6,500. The R1 has 85 megapixels at 20 frames per second, where the Alpha One offers 50 megapixels at 30 frames per second. But those 50 megapixels are not using a quad bear filter, so we actually might see comparable amounts of detail from that configuration. And the Alpha One is faster at that higher resolution. But drop the R1 down into 21 megapixel mode, and now it will do 40 frames per second, a full 30% more than the Sony Alpha One can do. The Alpha One does give the option to drop down to a lower resolution, but only with JPEG files. So you can use the lower resolution if you just don't want to store all those big files, but you're still limited to 30 frames per second. Pretty good, but would pros like an extra 30% for high action things? Yeah, we, we absolutely all would, even if it means sacrificing resolution, especially for sports. With wildlife, you kind of do want all that extra detail of the high resolution version of the sensor. The R1 would offer a global shutter, which would probably not show any artifacts under flickering lights and absolutely no rolling shutter. The F1 has a very, very fast shutter, which I, I've never seen any rolling shutter in real world conditions, but it does flicker a little bit in extreme test conditions. But, you know, because of the conditions, I'm not really allowed to shoot indoor sports at night currently, so I can't do real world stuff, but a global shutter is going to be better. Let's compare how the Canon R1 compares to the current standard for pro sport shooters, the 1DX Mark III DSLR. It's $2,000 more expensive based on the rumors, but it's also way more powerful. If you're a pro and you don't want high res pictures, you just want to keep it in that low res 21 megapixel mode, you can go from 16 or really like 12 to 14 real world frames per second up to a 40 real world frames per second. You also will never have to worry about banding because even mechanical shutters like in the 1DX will band in some extreme conditions because the shutter isn't open across the entire sensor when you're shooting at really high shutter speeds. It just opens a little window that kind of moves up and down. So you do see it in mechanical shutters, but you also get all the benefits of the electronic viewfinder, the eye detect autofocus, the corner to corner focusing points. And we find like shooting with the Canon R5 to be absolutely amazing. Like their autofocus system is just remarkable. And I know anytime a 1DX user picks that up, they're going to become hooked on it. Like when we did our sports test and we had players coming really close, the depth of field can be so shallow that you'll notice if it focused on the ball in the person's hands instead of their eyes. The R5 will find the eye and focus on it, just giving you better quality usable pictures way faster than you could possibly select a focusing point with the little thumbstick on the back, which is what the 1DX users are doing now. There's a big remaining question though. Canon really doesn't have any big sports lenses for their mirrorless R mount system. You could adapt. They have adapters and if you're a pro, you'd probably just buy a single adapter for every one of your lenses and just keep it semi permanently mounted there so you didn't have to worry about finding your adapter when you wanted to swap them. But at the same time, Canon has a real opportunity here to finally introduce their very short BRDO 600 millimeter F4 that we saw so many years ago. Canon has the tech to build very compact and yet fast lenses. And I think they might have been holding back releasing those to use it as an incentive to get their existing sports DSLR shooters migrated over to their mirrorless system. These new lenses that are going to be lighter, more compact, and thus easier to handhold and carry, that's going to be really alluring, especially when you package it with an R1 that gives you a more sophisticated focusing system and more options to choose from in any split second. I think Canon has a really good plan to win over their own customers, as well as push Sony and Nikon and Fuji another step back. What do you guys think? Would you buy this? Maybe not. It's really expensive, but do you think the pros will buy it? <laughs> Let me know and check out our sponsor Squarespace for just any type of website you need. Squarespace.com slash Tony gets you a free trial where you can try out the stores. You can check out the awesome analytics. You can see how the scheduling works. And if you love it, use the coupon code Tony and you'll get 10% off. Thank you, Squarespace.